Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And we're here with, of course, the weekly news uh, every week, same time, um, same person bringing us the news, Nick Bendel. Hi. It is so great to be here, Owen, and I love the fact that the weekly news happens every week. So that means it's not false advertising. Yes, it's, um, you never know, we might turn it into something else, but we, we let's let's keep it as it is. Um, yeah, no need to do any false advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. And we don't want to change things because we're scared of change. And let's just keep things as they are. All right. Well, uh, except for the news, because the news has to change every week. That is true. People would start to notice if we were doing the same three stories every week. <laughs> now, um, I, I notice you're still slumming on the Gold Coast there. Um, it's um, uh, what, what, What's your week uh, been like? Oh, it's been lovely. Uh, I take a quarterly working holiday. I do all the work I would normally do just from a different location. And for the past 13 days, I've been at Surface Paradise, staying 50 meters from the beach. The weather's beautiful. It's been so nice to run on the beach. Uh, I look, I can see the ocean right now. If I look away from your beautiful eyes, Owen, just glance to the side, I can see the ocean out my window. It's stunning. Still doing all the same work, but really enjoying the scenery. Fantastic. Well, um, good to hear. And, and, and how about your work week? Um, did you do you get any work with being distracted by the beach and the ocean? Well, um, funnily enough, uh, if you want to ensure that you have a heavier workload, book a working holiday because then everything will hit you at once. Uh, so I oh, have yes. actually been even busier than usual. Not that I'm complaining. It's a nice problem to have. And for those who don't know, I own a copywriting agency called Hunter and Scribe, which writes content for finance and property businesses. And, and just to give you an idea of what I've done over the past week, which is really a typical week, written a blog for an accountant, media release for a non-bank lender, social media posts for a credit repair agency, uh, website copy for a commercial buyer's agent, email newsletter for a mortgage broker. Pretty standard week. Uh, just a standard week from a different location. Wow. I can't keep up, Nick. Um, can't even remember all of that that you just said. So don't know how you got it all done. Well, lucky you're recording it. So you can go. Oh, yes. The... Yes. OK. I'll go back and listen to the podcast. <laughs> and um, what have you been up to and a Lee Field over the past week? Oh, busy week, busy week. Um, been leasing lots all around the country and a few, couple of new managements. Um, but um, thankfully, we've got a new uh, full time portfolio manager has started with us. Um, thank you to. Um, um, all of the the new business um, we needed to get uh, a new person on, so um, they've started and already making a huge difference in uh, being able to communicate better with uh, all of our clients. So um, yes, uh, very grateful to have her on board. And um, it's uh, apart from that, uh, yes, we've uh, just uh, busy onboarding some um, uh, new business partners as well. Um, so uh, a lot of buyers agents as well as some sales agents where we work as a 100% outsource solution for them to be able to build a rent roll asset. So yeah, working mm. with them to do that. I like that. So if I've understood correctly, they get to build the rent roll, but they don't have to do any of the work because they've outsourced all the work to Leafield. Yes, essentially it works like a... Uh, a referral agreement, uh, but we give them ownership rights over all of their um, uh, clients that they refer to us. So, um, yes, a little bit different. And uh, currently talking to a sales agent in Cairns, um, talking to a few more buyers agents who are buying right across the country for investors in different areas and which changes from time to time as markets change. And um, which I'm pretty sure you're going to bring up uh, something about that. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, we, we should get into the news, Nick. Um, let's stop talking about ourselves. Um, 
it's uh, so what's what's the first story this week? Well, our well, first story yeah. is opposition refuses to help government pass housing legislation. The federal government has passed its help to buy legislation in the House of Representatives, but can't get it approved in the Senate. The coalition, the Greens and some crossbenchers blocked a motion that would have seen the bill get put up for a vote in the Senate. As a result, help to buy has not yet been legislated. Under help to buy, the federal government will provide an equity contribution of up to 40% for buyers who want to purchase new homes and up to 30% for buyers who want to purchase existing homes. Buyers will need a deposit of just 2% and won't have to pay LMI. Help to buy will be limited to lower and middle income buyers and there will be price caps on the homes they can buy. I mean, I don't think we've spoken about help to buy before. I know we've spoken about other schemes. What are your thoughts about help to buy? Do you think it's a good scheme? Oh, it sounds great on the surface of it. It's like, yeah, who wouldn't want to get, um, you know, a, a 30 or 40 percent, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, help up um, by the government. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the devil's in the detail. Um, I, I haven't necessarily seen the detail. Um, but, um, you know, taking a, a bigger picture view of things, uh, why why should the government get involved with private ownership of people's houses? Um, yeah, what what rights are they going to have um, to be able to um, you know over the property? And um, you know how far is this going to go? It's just this, you know is the government looking at privatizing um, uh, home ownership at some point? Um, yeah, it sounds like something out of communist China. <laughs> um, okay, so let me uh, play devil's advocate here. Shouldn't shouldn't we support something like this? Because it can be hard for people, especially those on lower incomes, to buy their own home. We know the social benefit that comes from home ownership. Yep. So rather than forcing these people to rent all their lives, shouldn't the government provide some sort of leg up? And it's not a handout. Um, it's just an equity stake, and if these people sell at some point, then the government reclaims its money. Okay, okay, cool. Well, um, yeah, yes, uh, the government should definitely help to provide a better environment for the market to be able to take care of itself, um, which means that uh, we need to give people the ability to take responsibility for their own lives, um, by having a good job, being able to earn more, to be able to have enough to be able to save, to be able to afford a house. So all of those things are what our country has been built on. Um, and now instead of um, taking responsibility and fixing those issues, which are causing this problem to begin with, with a lack of housing supply, um, it's not a rental crisis, it's a housing crisis. People need to want to buy their own homes um it's um as as well as having a, any house to live in whether it's rental or to buy so it it's about the government being able to um provide a economic environment for people to be able to take responsibility for their own lives hmm. well what you said a moment ago was interesting about how something like help to buy addresses the symptoms, but not the cause of the problem. The, the yeah. problem is caused by a lack of supply. And this is, uh, this doesn't do anything to, well, I, I suppose it, there is an in, there is a larger incentive or larger assistance for people who want to build their own home, but this really isn't addressing the supply issue at all. No, not at all. It just uh, creates more demands, which will push prices up. So. You know, if, if people were able to, um, you know, get into some kind of property, but yes, now they're able to get into a bigger property, there's going to push more demand into those higher priced properties. So, yeah, let, let's provide uh, the amount of housing uh, so that these people can, um, who, who need this type of scheme, uh, can actually get into it themselves without government help. Well, if we are going to have government assistance schemes, should they be limited to uh, to buyers who are building new homes rather than buying existing homes? Um, 
Well, I think that comes down to the availability of new homes. It's um, and so if we're going to have a scheme um, to be able to help the lower income earners and to be able to buy where they need to 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 live, um, then um, yeah, there's not always new builds in in every area of the country. So um, yeah, I I. I I, I won't take that away from them. Hmm. Or what about a, a scheme where uh, the government lets occupants of social housing buy the property over a number of years? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I mean, that, um, uh, that has legs as well. It's if, if we're already helping people who aren't in a position to help themselves, and and then they get in themselves into a better situation um, from an income point of view and they can afford to start um, um, paying for something um, if um, give them the choice of either moving out and um, allow that social housing to um, be given to someone else or they start looking at um, being able to buy that um, that property that they're living in. Hmm. I, I, I know we discussed this last week uh, in, in terms of housing affordability. It's an issue that uh, crops up in the media from time to time, but it does feel this time as though the conversation has been lasting for longer yes. and that maybe there's more seriousness attached to it this time. So it'll be curious to see uh, with an election due next year to what extent housing policy affects people's votes. Mm. Absolutely, it's a it's a it's a big deal. We're um, seeing it in the uh, Queensland state election that's coming up next month, um, and um, yes, with inflation figures and interest rates in the news almost daily um, because of this um, housing crisis that we've had. Um, although uh, we are seeing it. Um, uh, ease off in certain areas of the country, and um, as more, especially on the rental side that we we deal with it on a daily basis, um, we're seeing a lot more supply of rental properties coming on the market, and rents in some areas actually coming down. Well, our next story is an interesting follow-up: twenty years of house prices. Which capital city has experienced the strongest growth in house prices over the past 20 years? The answer is Adelaide, based on Australian Bureau of Statistics median house price data covering the two decades to June 2024. Adelaide's median house price increased 209% over 20 years. Hobart 193, Brisbane 190, Perth 186, Sydney 181, Melbourne 165, Canberra 160, and Darwin 136%. Owen, why do you think Adelaide has experienced the most house price growth over the past 20 years? Um, well, they're, they're probably at the top of the list of this of this list right now because they've had uh, very high growth over the last number of years. Um, so say the last five years. Um, but there would have been a, a long time of um, very uh, flat or minimal growth. If we took the, if we did the 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 same, took the same figures uh, from five years ago or in five years' time, I think the the list would be very different. Mm. Well, I do have a follow up question along those lines, which I'm going to oh, ask right. you, which I'm going to ask you in a couple of minutes. But all right, what about? Darwin. Why, why do you think Darwin was at the bottom of the list? Um, uh, Darwin, uh, probably for for the same reason. Uh, in the last five years, it hasn't had a lot of growth. Um, but about ten years ago, it, it did. Um, so I think it's more about the timing of this survey. Hmm. Okay. So here's the question I want to ask. There's a theory that you may have heard of, which is that over the long term all the capital cities will experience the same level of growth approximately because if one city is up and another is down, investor money will flow from the city that appears to be near the end of a growth cycle to the city that appears to have growth ahead of it. And therefore, over the long term, it all evens out. 
So, Owen, do you think all the capital cities are destined to grow at about the same rate over the long term, or do you think local differences can produce different amounts of long-term growth? Um, in terms of capital cities, we would probably need to put them into two different categories. There would be the... Um, um, and that's why they grow at different different times as well. So you've probably got your 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 three to five major capital cities, and then you've got your your um, more minor ones. And um, and yes, yeah, so they grow at different times for different reasons, which are usually local. Um, and uh, and then there's just cyclical. Um, um, uh, factors as well that uh, cause uh, different capital cities to grow at different times. So, yeah, it's not an exact science. We we can be very general. Um, if we took each capital city individually and looked over the long term, yes, they all generally grow at the same rate, um, but just at different timings. Mm. Well, yes, that that's the key thing. So over the long term, are the cities going to grow at about the same rate? So if we started the clock today, uh, September 2074, would we find over the next 50 years that all the capital cities had recorded about the same house price growth? Uh, maybe. Uh, but but as you say, uh, they don't all grow at the same rate at the same time. The cycles are different. Yes, yes. I'd agree with that. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's revisit this issue in 2074 and okay. see see how accurate your your commentary was. Yes, and of course, this is very general, and um, the past does never equal the future. That is true. Yes. So everything could be different, but in general, from a macro level. Everything will be the same. <laughs> okay. That sounds like something I read on a fortune cookie last week. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the insights. Our final story today, Australia not building enough homes, says Minister. Australia is in the middle of a housing crisis which has been decades in the making, Federal Housing Minister Claire O'Neill said in a speech. Since the 1980s, the growth in incomes and property prices has been diverging, she said. At the turn of the century, the median household price was about four times average incomes. Today, it is nearly eight times. Why have prices gone up in this way? Because for a long, long time in our country, we have not been building enough homes. Minister O'Neill said Australia has less housing per person than comparable countries such as Canada, the UK and, Fr and France. Fewer homes means less affordable housing because the same number of buyers and renters are spread across fewer homes. It sounds trite, but what happens when we build more homes? Housing becomes more affordable, she said. Owen, is Claire O'Neill right that we are not building enough housing? Well, yes, I, I, I have to agree with her. It's, um, I, I certainly can't disagree. It's, um, uh, I mean, she's, been saying everything that we've been talking about about this issue for um since day one do you think she's a podcast listener you never know you know um but um it's I'm, I'm sorry to say it's not just us saying it nick yeah there are there are rather smart intelligent people out there who've been saying it as well well some of these smart intelligent people are saying that the government is not going to be able to achieve its housing target. For those who don't know, the government is aiming to facilitate the building of 1.2 million new homes uh, in the five years from July 2024. Uh, yep. People are saying 1.2 seems very ambitious based on uh, kind of the pipeline that's happening at the moment. People are saying maybe 800, 900,000 is more realistic. What are the consequences going to be if we keep underperforming in terms of home building? It'll be same, same as usual. Property prices going up. Um, everyone starts um, blaming investors for for um, buying up all the houses. 
um, and pushing pushing prices and pushing rents up where it's not the case at all. Um, they're part of the, the solution. Um, we can see it in Perth now where, where investors have bought up a lot of properties and rents are actually starting to come down um, as a result because there's an oversupply in, in, in many areas. Um, and uh, the government is, um, as per the previous story, um, uh, just uh, seems to be focused on, on providing Band-Aid solutions um, that drive more demand rather than trying to fix the underlying issues that are causing this lack of supply. Mm. Well, if we both believe, and it appears we do, that uh, we need to build baby build it is frustrating then that for whatever reason it's not happening i think that the government is sincere i think the government does want more housing to be built but for whatever reason it's struggling to turn that wish into reality yes they, they need to fix the red tape um, on all levels of government from local to state as, as well as federal, to be able to release more land, get development applications approved quicker, um, stop this, uh, stop these NIMBYs who are just trying to uh, stop any development happening in their backyard that they don't like. Um, you know, we, we all live in a growing um, uh, country and growing cities where we need to uh, accept that things will change and our life will change. And if you don't like where the government has planned uh, for development to happen, then uh, because it's in your backyard, then you're going to have to move somewhere else where it's um, where it's still a nice sleepy hollow where you can um, live your life. Um, because there's plenty of places like that in in Australia, um, but if you live in a capital city, um, it's not going to remain like that. Mm, that that's a very good point. Our capital cities are going to get denser. So yes. we need to accept that there are going to be more people uh, per square kilometre. Our suburbs are going to have more people. There's going to be more activity. Uh, if we live in capital cities and we don't like that, I guess we could move to Broken Hill, which is a lovely place, or we could move to other small communities. And there are a lot of really beautiful uh, smaller places in Australia. The trade-off, though, is the economies are not the same as in the big cities, so it can be harder to find uh, meaningful work. Yes, true. So um, that's where we need to um, uh, prioritise the, the uh, provision of housing within close proximity to where people need to work, and that means that um, development has to happen around existing infrastructure. Um, and um, yes, people need to accept that. So um, yes, development applications need to be able to be easily approved and uh, move forward um, so that um, you know, be before building costs increase, um, we need to be able to um, make it easy for these builders to employ people um, so that um, they don't get uh, stuck with red tape and um, and unions holding up developments as well, um, and it's and holding everyone to ransom. It's it's um, the whole country has been held to ransom by this inability for governments of all levels to move forward and uh, get housing built. It's um, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. It's gone on for long enough. Another thing they can do is to um, have, do something about um, the housing taxes. They mm -hmm. they need tax reform around stamp duty and land tax, which are all state government taxes. Uh, but uh, all levels of government can get get involved to be able to make that happen. Um, there's also a lot of taxes up front that lo local government charges to developers to be able to um, build um, to build the infrastructure that's required for um, um, for these developments. So yes, it's very much needed to be able to to do these developments, but surely all levels of government could get involved to be able to help 
this funding um, of this infrastructure infrastructure cost instead of it being dumped on uh, developers up front for them to have to pay and uh, that just adds further cost to uh, to the housing that needs to be built. Well, if Claire O'Neill is a podcast listener and I'm 92% sure she does listen to us, now she knows what she needs to do. Exactly. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's she just needs to listen to you and I, Nick. Yeah. Well, we provide our advice for free and we are agnostic. <laughs> We're happy for both sides of politics to implement our ideas. Oh, yeah. Don't care who does it. Just uh, someone, please do it. It's, yeah, it has to be done. Okay. Well, on that note, Thank you, as always, Owen, for your insights. Always enjoy these chats. All right, cool. Thank you, Nick. And please, I know I'll see you next week. You, you, you've never missed um, a, a week of the weekly news, and I'm looking forward to um, the next three stories. See you then. See ya. See ya.